Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we cover the way news gets reported. No story has generated more news coverage over the past year than Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This past week, the date lines included Kramatorsk and Kherson, where civilian infrastructure was targeted by Russian airstrikes, as well as Makivka, where dozens of Russian soldiers were killed in retaliatory missile attacks. A war that many analysts had predicted would last just a few days is now approaching its first anniversary. Against all odds, Ukrainian forces have driven the Russian military out of more than half of the territory it had taken. Russia's response strikes on Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Millions of homes have gone dark and cold. On this special edition of our program, a chronology of our reports through 2022 on the media dimension of this conflict, from the build-up to the invasion right through the information war and the global media's news coverage. Our starting point is this time last year, six weeks before the fighting began. 100,000 Russian troops amassed on or near the border with Ukraine. Moscow and Washington both sticking to their positions in negotiations over NATO expanding to the east. Out of the west, headlines reminding us the stakes are high. And Russia's state-approved media, if not beating, at least tapping the drums of war. On the surface, it all sounds very 2014, when Russian forces invaded Ukraine and annexed Crimea. Only a lot of things have changed since then. Absolutely, you don't have the sort of war frenzy vibe that you did in 2014 when the, the state TV hosts are really frothing at the mouth for, over Ukraine. And there are a few reasons for that. Firstly, the, the magic Crimea dust uh, that works so well for Putin and sent his uh, approval ratings to record levels for a time, it's, it's really worn off because it's, the circumstances have changed. There's much more of a focus on uh, rising inflation, falling incomes, and the pandemic. This whole mess around Ukraine and around Ukraine's uh, so-called integration to NATO uh, is, uh, in my opinion, connected to Vladimir Putin's internal popularity and his ratings, which are not very good. And uh, it's funny how Russian state media covers the situation, because to them, and the main goal is to cover anything except internal problems, anything except the violation of human rights or killing the free press. The Russian president signaled his intentions on Ukraine last July, and not by conventional means. Rather than issue a press release or hold a news conference, the Kremlin posted a 5,000-word essay that it said was written by Vladimir Putin himself on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. That essay was posted in three languages, aimed at three audiences, Russian, Ukrainian, and English speakers. Um, Putin's essay did was a history lesson about what he says was Ukrainian and Russian unity. But in reality, it, it was an essay of disinformation. Putin's language for unity is basically, we were united because we colonized you and because we subjected you to our power. It had nothing to do with their liberty and their choice. In a 21st century information war, waged on multiple digital fronts, the Russian attack on the TV tower in Kiev felt like a throwback to an earlier, simpler time, when television was king and taking over the airwaves meant that an invading force or rebel army could control the narrative. TV no longer matters the way it once did, but it clearly matters to Vladimir Putin. The attacking of the Kiev uh, TV tower was, was, of course, a deliberate strategy. This is where the uh, actual war and uh, media war are converging, because Putin did his best to have Russian society brainwashed by propaganda. So he assumes that everyone else is like that too, which is uh, wrong on many different levels, because it's really not like Ukrainians are only fighting back the because their t television tells them to. Капитан армии Александр Лысенко трагически погиб при исполнении воинского долга. Он участвовал в специальной операции на Украине. To hear the Russian media describe it, there is no war in Ukraine, just a special military operation ordered by the Kremlin. Мы продолжаем рассказывать вам о 
войне в Украине, которая официально российскими властями называется специальной военной операцией. When the independent outlet TV Dodged called it an invasion instead, and the radio station Echo Moskvi did the same, the prosecutor general's office ordered them to be taken off the air. There are tit-for-tat measures taken over the information side of this war by political players and big tech companies. The European Union has banned Russian state-owned channels RT and Sputnik, leaving it to its member states and their regulators to enforce the new policy. YouTube, TikTok and Meta, which controls Facebook and Instagram, have all blocked RT and Sputnik news content. Google has removed the channels from its news search tool and dropped their mobile apps from its Play Store. Russia's media regulators subsequently throttled Twitter, slowing its loading speed down to a crawl for what it called Twitter's failure to take down fake news posts on Ukraine. Media control is, is very essential for Putin right now. Uh, it, not just Russia, any country that is in the middle of a war effort. But there are better ways to deal with Russian misinformation and disinformation than just outright censorship. I'm worried about the precedent that sets, for one. And if the West is condemning the Russian government for cracking down on speech and free media over in Russia, it's not a great look for the West to be engaging in activities that appear uh, to be the same. This is what an information war looks like when it hits the streets. Police in Moscow's Lubyanka Square, wrapped in body armor, seizing the phones of citizens, searching for evidence of resistance, telltale social media content about the war in Ukraine that can land people in prison. It's doom scrolling, Russian style. Moscow is one of the most surveilled cities in the world. It has an incredible system of facial recognition technology. And if you are to go out uh, into the streets, when you know that you will be punished for it, when it's your phone taken and everything, including your contacts and everything else, yeah, it's chilling. All this is so draconian. This approach is not sustainable long term. And the more extreme measures uh, uh, of policing and censorship the government is using, the more we should recognize it as a sign of weakness. Anyone calling the war in Ukraine what it is, a war, as opposed to the Kremlin's Orwellian term, a special military operation, is now at risk of 15 years behind bars. That new law applies to foreign journalists as well and has effectively paralyzed their outlets operating in Russia. Normally uh, based in Moscow, but since the Kremlin shut down our bureau, then revoked accreditation. With television brought to heel long ago, the authorities used to tolerate a few independent news outlets, in print and online. That is no longer the case. Dojd, a news channel that lived on YouTube, and the radio station Eka Moskvi are now out of business. Many of their journalists have fled the country. We could not imagine that it would happen so fast that they would just ruin everything in a couple of days, that they would just, you know, shut down. The war with TV, TV Rain, with Dorst, started in 2014, uh, when the popularity of our channel was so high that the government of Russia understood that something should be done. We have millions of viewers and the journalists and anchors of TV Rain were the most famous people in Russia. Dorst was the only liberal, alive TV channel discussing things that 
were banned on other TV stations. So after the revolution and then Crimea annexation and then war in Donbas, thirst became a problem for the government. Obviously, I'm out of country. Uh, we were obliged to leave Russia because of the situation, which was devastating. We have faced military censorship and also me personally and a couple of my colleagues were getting threats from different people, calls, messages, terrible things. The website of TV Raid was blocked. And to me, this was the final signal, final call. I was absolutely sure, no chance that we would survive in this country. So that's why we have left. We want to see it as a temporary slowdown, as a temporary pause. I'm sure that something will be done. I'm sure that TV Rain will be back uh, in some kind of form. And I'm sure that it's not the end. This is what remains of Mariupol in southeastern Ukraine. A besieged city the Kremlin does not want the world to see. A maternity hospital bombed, graves piling up. Images captured by two AP journalists who say their names were on a list to be hunted down by Russians. As they reported, with no information coming out, no pictures of demolished buildings and dying children, Russian forces could do whatever they wanted. If not for us, there would be nothing. And while those soldiers are out to stop journalism, they may as well target any Ukrainian with a mobile phone. Ukrainians have been mm, incredibly effective communicators because they've got a good story to tell. But they're doing what anyone in this situation in the 21st century would do. Instead of taking selfies of yourself and in a shopping mall, you are taking selfies of yourself in a bomb shelter and you're pushing them out and to, you know, you're contributing to telling the story. Where Russian forces have been unable to take control of an area, such as Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv, they have forced the population into submission through airstrikes and artillery. Kharkiv has been leveled, largely abandoned, and Maria Avdieva has stayed behind. She's new to citizen journalism, a would-be witness to war crimes, who does her work with one eye on the International Court of Justice in The Hague. I am here to document the war crimes committed by Putin and his regime. I was not uh, you know, a war reporter or uh, anyone who was active on social media. But when the war started and I saw that the, this disinformation wave coming out of Russia, I saw that my role in this fight might be in uh, information battlefield. They deny the fact of war in Ukraine. They deny the fact of genocide, killing of civilians and children. Because Russia uses information as another kind of weapon. You hear this challenge right now when I speak to you. That it doesn't stop day and night. Russia continues terrorizing my sea. So that's why I'm trying to give as much information from the ground so that the uh, court in Hague will use these evidences to punish those who were responsible for committing war crimes in Ukraine. With all of the news channels the Kremlin has at its disposal, and a disinformation industry that's been years in the making. Vladimir Putin entered this war of narratives, holding most of the cards. Despite that, the Russians have proven incapable of stopping the news coming out of the battlefield. Citizen journalism, powered by mobile phone technology, is a big part of that. 
So is traditional war zone reporting, correspondence and camera crews in the field with targets on their back. Ukraine in its darkest hour is experiencing a golden age of journalism, if that's any consolation. Putin's biggest miscalculation in this war has been Ukrainian resistance and Ukrainian resilience. The way that the Ukrainian identity has been shaped by the revolutions and by the war of the last decade has been incredible to watch. This is a society that is operating on adrenaline right now entirely. And we should be really conscious of that, that behind that strength and that resilience is, uh, is an enormous trauma. Vlogging from his bunker, beaming into parliaments in combat fatigues, welcoming world leaders on the streets of war-torn Kyiv. Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, has a flair for public relations, winning the world's hearts and minds one photo op at a time. He was a comedian. He had never held political office before 2019. He didn't know anything about public policy, but he is indisputably the right man for the job because he knows how to communicate. And he knows how to communicate brilliantly in Russian, which drives Vladimir Putin crazy, right? A photogenic president who, by comparison, is making Vladimir Putin's PR game fall flat. Lacking the digital savviness or panache, Putin has stuck to his old playbook. Media personalities parroting his talking points alongside his own turgid personal performances that would give even the best communications team little to work with. That contrast, Vladimir 2.0 versus Vladimir 1.0, was on full display in last week's Victory Day speeches. Absolutely unacceptable for us. Although, not directly on our borders. President Putin and his suit, you know, he looked very staid. He looked very much a sort of elderly political figure of the last century and somebody who wasn't thinking in terms of the medium in quite the same way. In Zelensky's address, that black and white video shot in the ruined city. Very carefully scripted, very carefully structured to catch the international audience and make it clear that for him, this is yes, obviously a war that his country is involved in, but it's also a much wider issue for the world. Putin and Zelensky have very different aims and different goals in their public discourse. So whereas for Zelensky, one of his aims is to bring the Ukrainian nation together and the other one is to appeal to the West. Putin's aims are very different. Putin's aims with his own domestic audience is actually to keep them disinterested. He doesn't need great support or even the rallying around the flag. He just needs the Russian public not to be fervently anti-Putin and not to go out onto the streets. Begging the question, who really comes out ahead in this information war? Zelensky with his digital diplomacy and penchant for PR, or Putin with the messengers in the Russian media doing his bidding? The positive reviews, the accolades that Zelensky is getting around the world are of no consolation, though, to Ukrainians, whose homes and lives have been shattered by Russian bombs falling from the sky. And ultimately, the skies, not the airwaves, not the news feeds, are where this war will be won or lost. If we compare what uh, state propaganda was uh, telling about uh, this war at the beginning, in March, uh, and, and now these are two totally different wars, because, because back then... главной целью операции – демилитаризация и денацификация Украины. The Ukrainian nation, oppressed by the Nazi government, would definitely um, support uh, Russian troops and, uh, and Russian control. 
And when it didn't happen, the propaganda has to explain all the defeats and retreats. The союзные силы сейчас усиливают оборону. Штурмовые группы дают жесткий отпор националистам. And why the military operation that was expected to to take like three, four days already lasts more than half a year, and there is no end in sight. Russians searching for more reliable war reporting have turned to the messaging app Telegram and military bloggers embedded with Russian forces with followings in the hundreds of thousands, sometimes more. They publish detailed information, maps of troop movements when allowed. They blog with a pro-war perspective and are distinctly unhappy with the news they are reporting. We start to see this looking for who is to blame. Sladkov, one of the most popular, was talking about how you know arrests need to be made because the military are clearly not adhering to the constitution. The accusations that are coming out remind one of, of even darker times in Russia's history and the need for sort of purging. That said, these people, they are more extreme than the government, so they shouldn't be misunderstood as that's the direction of the Kremlin, but they, but they are influential. The opposition to this war is not from those who are anti-war. They have been repressed sufficiently in the demonstrations, the arrests. It is now coming from a far right and a far, far right, an extremist nationalist right. But that is a very important opposition and they have their own apps, they have their own media, they have their own newsletters. It's an important trend to watch as the war goes badly. On November 9th, the U.S.'s top military officer, General Mark Milley, went against the White House's official line, saying that since neither Russia nor Ukraine can hope to achieve a military victory, the time had come for diplomacy, peace talks, which signals a significant turn. Just last month, when 30 members of U.S. Congress, progressive Democrats, quietly sent a letter to President Biden calling for negotiations, the blowback, much of it on social media, was so bad that the letter was withdrawn that same day. Nobody in Washington wants to be labeled as soft on Russia or somehow sympathetic toward Putin, and we saw that play out in the media coverage. The reaction was ironic because very shortly after the letter was retracted, we learned that the national security advisor to uh, President Biden, Jake Sullivan, has in fact been talking to the Ukrainians about the possibility of negotiations. He's been talking to senior advisors to President Putin. And the Western establishment and part of the uh, media community in the West uh, is um, uh, so invested in this conflict, they dismiss diplomacy. That President Putin has perpetrated um, and sponsored and ordered by his military atrocities, war crimes, make him unsuitable for any kind of a conversation between... The they uh, see it as uh, heresy. It's not looking like the Russian political regime is uh, going to collapse in, in the near future. Um, so why not uh, talk about diplomacy? It also speaks to the role that the media unfortunately has played uh, throughout this war, which is to, to egg on the Biden administration uh, to be more aggressive, more escalatory, uh, to get deeper involved in the conflict. What about offensive weapons? I mean, being able to disrupt, intercept, shoot down Russian incoming is one thing, but we sure. know the Ukrainians want advanced rocket systems, advanced missiles. A lot of the news coverage of this war has taken on some of the worst characteristics of Cold War reporting. Uh, and by the way, how did the Cold War end? Uh, it ended through years, if not decades, of talks. The Cold War made us realize the importance of talking to one's adversary, to one's enemy even, uh, especially if that adversary is a hugely powerful country that's sitting on thousands of nuclear warheads. And some of that thinking has been lost today, I think. A war that so many experts told us would never happen is about to enter its second year. The fight over the narrative goes on with propaganda and disinformation polluting our news feeds. At least 15 media workers, most of them Ukrainian, have been killed covering the fighting. Russian journalism 
is another casualty, with independent voices long since intimidated into silence or living in exile. Despite the reporting challenges, the ever-present fog of war shrouding the truth, we will continue to follow this story and how the global media are covering Ukraine here at The Listening Post.